Last week we looked at two of the four building blocks that make up a DAC. In this video we continue with the DA conversion and filtering plus the analog circuits. Let's start with the conversion. Once the input signal is received and converted to an internal standard, often I2S, it is sent to the electronics that convert the audio bits into analog audio. Depending on the design, this signal is first upsampled and then converted, after which a mild filter might be added. Or it is first converted to analog and then filtered using an analog reconstruction filter. In the upsampling variant, the upsampling also contains the reconstruction filter. There are two types of filters used, linear phase and minimum phase. When digital was introduced over 40 years ago, the linear phase brick wall filter was used universally. And even today, this is the filter used in most mainstream digital equipment. The reason is that it looks like a good solution if you prefer measurements over listening. The frequency response is ruler flat and it has a linear phase behavior, hence the name. So uh, it seems to be a road to success since Nyquist has promised that when a band limited signal is sampled at double the bandwidth, it encodes 100% of the information in that signal. If you have ever heard an early CD player, you know it didn't work out that way. Don't get me wrong, Nyquist's theorem was 100% correct but it appeared to be impossible to band limit an audio signal without partly damaging it. I know, the measurements showed the output signal was perfect, but it didn't sound like perfect. We now know there are two major reasons for that and they both take place in the time domain. Jitter and ringing caused by the reconstruction filter. I did a video on jitter called Network Music Players Quality Part 2, Jitter. It might be interesting to watch that video too, links at the usual places. In this video we look at the reconstruction filter. The problem with linear phase brick wall filters is that they produce pre-ringing, something that can't happen in nature but does happen in digital filtering, a sound starts before the original sound starts. That ruins transients and has a severe impact on how we perceive the sound. Transients are extremely important for the perception of low frequencies. Our ears are poor transducers for low frequencies, but our brain has found a way to analyze transients and reconstruct low frequency from that. This is perhaps best demonstrated by the smartphone. In this graph you see the average frequency response of smartphones. It is very limited in bandwidth. If we take a loose plus and minus 5 dB window, we find 500 Hz to 3800 Hz. Now think about how a male voice sounds on your smartphone. Does it sound like Mickey Mouse? No, you hear a normal voice despite the fact that all below 500 Hz is cut off. The secret lies in the transients. Our auditory system analyzes the beginning of a sound and so knows the frequency content. Now what if that beginning is polluted by pre-ringing? Well, first there will be an incorrect impression of the frequency content, despite that measurement equipment will see a correct frequency response. But also the ear is already warned that a sound is coming and it is my belief that here lies a secret of the black background. Furthermore, it will disturb timing information in the sound stage and reduce resolution. The classic linear phase brick wall filter produces about 10 cycles of pre-ringing and 10 cycles of post-ringing. This can drastically be reduced by having the filters roll off more gradually while having the roll off point lower in the audio band. When then the other type of filter is used, the minimum phase filter, the phase response is no longer linear, oh dear. Luckily, the phase response varies especially at high frequencies and the result is that there is no longer pre-ringing, plus that the pre-ringing that was caused by the anti-aliasing filter during recording is also filtered out. Since the energy of the pre-ringing in this filter is delayed, it is added to the post-ringing, 
but post ringing occurs in nature too, so it's more natural to our hearing. This filter is called an apodizing filter and is one of the philosophies behind MQA. Apodizing filtering is also used in imaging, photography, astronomy and so on. It makes it possible to have better time behavior for affordable money. Theoretically this approach is incorrect since the bandwidth isn't fully limited to half the sampling frequency and thus some aliasing will take place. But this will only be at high frequencies and can be filtered out in the analog domain. The more costly approach is programming an upsampler and a reconstruction filter in a custom digital signal processor. That can be a microprocessor or an FPGA, a field programmable gate array. The first is used with DAC chips that offer the option to be used with external microprocessor to do the upsampling and filtering. They do offer a better time behavior provided the code used is good. MQA corrects for time problems in DACs and often use a microprocessor. And while they use apodizing filters, that DAC will also have better timing behavior when non-MQA material is placed. The FPGA solution usually does the D to A conversion by itself. Over the years FPGAs have become more and more powerful to the point that with the right algorithms they can now achieve filtering with far better time behavior. By the way, there are also DACs that make use of the FPGA for other functions, like in R2R DACs for programming the switches that combine resistors in the ladder converter. After the conversion the signal is analog and thus need to comply to the demands of analog circuits. First the current coming from the DA converter needs to be converted to voltage. Then the signal is buffered by an op amp. This can be an integrated circuit or built discreetly. Again when done properly both solutions can sound great but discreetly built output stages can be less sensitive to high frequency noise than op amp chips. In a less optimal design several problems can occur. High frequency noise caused by clock signals that are used for interfacing and converting can have severe influence on audio. When both digital and analog circuits use the same power supply that can interfere too. Most digital to analog converter chips are balanced out so it might be beneficiary when the analog output stage is also balanced. Quality capacitors also can do a lot of good to analog and so on. A DAC is built from a chain of circuits and each chain is as strong as its weakest link. That begins with the power supply. The noise of the voltage regulators varies drastically even between the same types. Noise on the ground plane causes jitter during the digital to analog conversion. Poor performing power supplies can lead to poor transients in analog circuits. Poor digital input circuits again can cause jitter and don't believe that I2S is always better than USB or AES3. To have a good interfacing between the sending and the receiving end of the digital connection requires proper design of the output circuit, the input circuit, the interconnecting cable and a clean ground plane. We come from a time where the frequency domain got all the attention while in the forefront of serious audio designers the focus now is on the time domain. A domain where measurements are difficult and very difficult to interpret. Therefore ears still form the best way to judge audio equipment, especially DACs. Which brings me to the end of this video. I'll be back next Friday at 5 pm Central European time. If you don't want to miss that, subscribe to this channel or follow me on the social media so you will be informed when new videos are out. Help me reach even more people by giving this video a thumb up or link to this video on the social media. It is much appreciated. Many thanks to those viewers that support this channel financially. It keeps me independent and lets me improve the channel further. If that makes you feel like supporting my work too, the links are in the comments below this video on YouTube. I'm Hans Beekhuizen, thank you for watching and see you in the next show or on the HBproject.com. And whatever you do, enjoy the music.